reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Let me now sing of my friend, my friend's song concerning his vineyard. My friend had a vineyard and planted the choicest vines. He spaded it, cleared, of, cleared it of stones, and within it he built a watchtower. Then he looked for a crop of grapes. But what he yielded was wild grapes. Now inhabitants of Ju Jerusalem and people of Judea judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done? Why, when I looked for a, the crop of grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? Now I will let you know what I mean to do with my vineyard. Take away its hedge, give it to grazing, break through its wall, let it be trans trampled. Yes, I will make it a ruin. It shall not be pruned or hoed, but overgrown with thorns and briars. I will command the clouds not to send rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his cherished plant. He looked for judgment, but see, bloodshed. For justice, but hark the outcry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, and if there's any excellence and there is anything worthy of praise, think of these things. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, then the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders of the people, hear another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenants and went on a journey. When vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to obtain his produce. But the tenants seized the servants, and one they beat, another one they killed, and a third they stoned. Again he sent other servants, more numerous than the first ones but they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them thinking, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and acquire his inheritance. They seized them, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What will the owner of the vineyard do to these tenants when he comes? They answered him. He will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyard to other tenants who would give him the produce at the proper times. Jesus said to them, do you never read in scriptures? The stone that builders rejected has become the cornerstone. But the Lord has this been done and is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that will produce its fruit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the gospel reading today, we hear in the end 
Jesus telling the crowds, these are Jewish people who, who thought that just because they, they are Jewish, just because they belong to the, uh, Israel, they automatically are safe and they are saved and that they are in God's kingdom. Jesus told them that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a people that will produce its fruits. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a people that will produce its fruits. In other words, do not think that uh, salvation is automatic without your participation in it. The reason why the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you is because you have been given. You have been given what it takes to produce the fruits, but you are wasting it. You are not working it. You are not using it. My dear brothers and sisters, that also must be something that we have to take into consideration when we are living our Christian lives. We too should hear these words from Jesus as applicable to us because Jesus has given us that salvation. Jesus has won for us salvation. We know God. We read the Bible. We, are, we belong to a, a community, a community that always nurtures our faith, a community that always provides for our spirituality, that each and every one of us is able to cultivate our own spirituality from our association with other members of the community. This community is forging that faith of Jesus Christ in us to be able to live our lives. And so we have, we have that duty to produce fruit. We are like, like, like the, the uh, uh, vine, uh, the, 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 the master of the vineyard who planted the vineyard and gave it to a people and kept coming to get, get the produce. He expected to get something because he has worked hard to plant the vineyard. So he expected that he will receive something. This whole story is figurative of the real understanding of how God created human beings. You remember that in Genesis, the Bible tells us that God created the humans planted a garden, and placed them in that beautiful garden of Eden. That's also a story, but it's meant to tell us that God actually provided for us. And God told them, the first humans, God told them, increase and multiply. Dominate the world. Increase and multiply. That, sent, that, that saying was not just meant for uh, breeding or pouring out babies. It is part of it. We are meant to reproduce, but it's also a reproduction of knowledge. It's also to increase and multiply our knowledge, to search, to think, to imagine the power of the imagination. The imagination is what brought about religion, even in the first place. To get to discover more, what God was telling them when God created us, God created humanity. When he says increase and multiply, he was telling, God was telling them, I have created this big world, and I have created you, and I have put something in you that is capable of discovering the rest of the things that I have created in this mystery, uh, this wide world. So use your, your, that, that capacity. 
use that capacity to discover more. And look, brothers and sisters, we have done that. We have been doing that, and we will continue to do that and reproduce. We came to know God. Religion was produced by the human imagination that kept thinking about, about the world and then believed in, in himself or herself that there must be something greater that created these things. There must be something greater that created me. That's how the concept of God came about. Human being was pondering and thinking and, and, and praying and, 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 and discovered that there must be something bigger if you can have something like the sea, the vastness of it, the universe, and all these things, there must be something controlling these things. There must be something that created this thing. And that is that God, that big thing that created all these things. And therefore, the human being began to relate with that mystery, that vastness, that infinity. Human being began to relate with that. Human being began to think and imagine. This is, the, this is all about religion. This is how, how we came by religion. How we relate with that thing that must be the creator of everything, creator of our, ourselves. And our relationship with that is religion. And we continue to deepen our understanding of that relationship. We don't know everything about that relationship yet because we don't know everything about God yet. But we keep doing it, and we are discovering more. The way we worship today, for instance, eh, all the things we are doing here, the colors and all that, they were not like that at the beginning. At the beginning, it was a simple meal. They came together and ate the meal uh, uh, in a family. It was even house churches. They came together and, and celebrated and felt Jesus' presence. But as time went on, we, we, we were discovering new things, new ways. And up to today, look at what religion is. It's not going to be like this. 200 years to come, it's going to change. It's going to be transformed into something that is not, cannot be recognizable uh, in relation to what we have today. It's all because we are doing what God said to us. Increase and multiply. It's, 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 it's an increase of the knowledge of the beauty of the world, the secrets in the air, the secrets in the universe, the secrets in the ground, the secrets in the sea. We have done a lot, and we have created a lot of things. Where I am leading to, brothers and sisters, is that science, scientific discovery, is also God's revelation to us. Scientific discovery is not against our belief in God because science discovers the secrets that are in the air, the secrets that are in the sea, the secrets that are in, in iron and, and, and soil and wood and, and, and all these things in the air, science is discovering more of these mysteries that God put in the universe. And it is God who is showing to us how these things work. And we are called upon to religion cannot fight science. We rather receive it as God's blessing to know that this herb or this tree back heals this disease. That's, that's, that's God's gift given to some of us, our scientists, who discover these things for us. And therefore, we are not against. Some time ago, we thought we were against. We thought the church or religion was against science. Since 1965, we don't think that way anymore. 
instead, brothers and sisters, in order to produce the fruits of the kingdom of God, we need to listen to science. We need to listen to history. We need to listen to, to, to uh, anthropology. We need to listen to the social sciences. We need to listen to political sciences. We need to engage. We need to talk. We need to dialogue with science and get to know more about how human beings behave when you put them together. There's a science around it. There is something around that. We need to use all these things to get to understand how God is blessing our world. We cannot fight these things anymore. And the, and the church teaches that. I am not telling you something that I pulled from my, myself. I am telling you something that the church came together and agreed that from now on, we will talk with other religions. We will talk with science. We will talk because the church made a mistake before. And many of you who are scientists know about Galileo, what the church did, the mistake we, did, we made with Galileo when Galileo told us the truth and it, he was chastised and after his death, we came to find out we were wrong. No more. If we are going to produce and be good Christians, we have to be, we have to see and thank God for the scientific discoveries. That is the only way that we can live and survive. That's the only way we can beat any pandemic in our world. That's the only way that we can beat any social evil in our world. Any racism, any discrimination, anything that comes in our world, we can beat that if we dialogue with these, these, these sciences. So brothers and sisters, that should help us to, to navigate the problems we have in our world and our country today. And as I told you and I promised you, I will not stop help talking about how we as Christians approach this whole idea of selection of a leader of our country, voting. To vote as a Christian, there is something in us that the catechism teaches. We teach, the church teaches, that is something in ourselves that is called conscience. That conscience is the most important thing that we have in ourselves. Conscience is that capacity to choose the good against the evil. Conscience is what does that. And it will tell you, it will tell you before you act. And it will come back again after you have acted to judge whatever you have done. And it's just you, not anybody from outside. Conscience. And each and every one of us has that conscience. God gave it to us. God gave us conscience to be able to make decisions and to be able to choose for God. That conscience, we... In, in religion, we don't even have power over it. All we need to do, all we do in the church is to help you form that conscience, is to help you to feed that conscience. And when you are fed with our preaching, with our teaching, with our fellowship, with our, all the things that we do here, it's meant to build individual conscience. And so when it comes to voting, that is what you use to judge, to, to, to judge the, the, the issues that are at stake, issues that, that, that pertain to you. That is what you use. I have told you again, no one should tell you who to vote for. People should tell you and, and admonish you and tell you what Jesus, what, the, what religion, what Jesus will do. But at the end of the day, you are to use your conscience and no one is going to exercise that for you. You have to use that conscience to judge the issues 
and vote, and you must obey conscience. Because if you don't obey conscience, I am not the one who will come and chastise you. I don't have that right. I am not the one who will come and say a condemnation. And a, no, I don't have that right. Conscience is within you and your conscience. It will beat you until you, you change, until you make amends. And you will feel it yourself. If you have done wrong, you know you have done wrong. If you have done right, it, it congratulates you. It is in us. So try it. That is why voting is a Christian duty. It is a Christian duty, brothers and sisters. It is time for us to exercise our Christianity. That conscience that we have been ready, if you say you have been going to church all the time, you've been reading the Bible, you are a Christian, you believe in God, you have it. You have conscience formed in a Christian conscience. Weigh the issues with it. Now, I've heard that there are certain places, some people, have, they have certain, they have put up certain uh, teachings of the church, uh, four or five teachings that, that are non-negotiable. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing evil in the world that is negotiable. There is nothing. So don't vote on one issue. Choose a lot of issues. Go on a lot of issues and evaluate them. Human beings are more complicated than four or five issues. So do, there's nothing like that, non-negotiable and other things are negotiable. Racism is non-negotiable just as uh, 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 any other sin is non-negotiable. Instead, we will always vote with love, with our conscience. Judge the issues that way. And that's a hard work to do, but you must produce fruit. Otherwise, the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from us and given to other people who will do the hard work of using their conscience and, and doing the hard work. It is a hard work regardless, but we are called to exercise that. That is the way that we can uh, 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 guarantee the kingdom of heaven in our world. We thank God for inspiring us once again, giving us this gospel text. May it be always in front of us and, and inspire us to use our conscience to do the hard work of the Christian living to bring peace and justice to our world. Amen.